Thanks, guys. You take one guess who's the guy that works in the truck, and take one guess who's the guy that's creative and takes that black ca blank canvas. I want to thank Craig for getting dressed up tonight, today. <laughs> Put on his best T-shirt. Thank you, Craig, for that. This is like a hip, right? Isn't this cool? Yeah. All right, so uh, we're going to go back and forth a little bit. Uh, and, and the key here is not just storytelling, but how what Pete does creates these incredible opens, sets the stage to what follows. So Pete will start. Um, thanks for having us, first of all. It's exciting to be here. I've heard about this event, and it's my first time here, so thank you. Um, as far as what we do, I think at the end of the day, I th you know, everyone knows the audience is tuning in to watch the game, to see the players, and that's fine. And Craig and his crew does a great job with that. But I think there's an expectation of us, especially at the network level, but I think at every level at this point, um, for the fans and viewers to be entertained beyond just the game. Um, and that's where jobs like mine, thankfully, uh, were, ex were created. Otherwise, I don't know where I'd be. So my job as creative director at CBS Sports, I, I, I'm fortunate. It's, where I do stuff beyond my role as creative director, but I'll go down the list real quickly to give you a sense of some of the things I'm responsible for with starting with, with the least exciting, in my mind at least, which is graphics, our animations, our theme music, um, all of that stuff I oversee the creative on. It's a little bit um, mundane and, and could be uh, not the greatest, uh, most exciting to sit in a room and go over colors for lower third graphics, but it's part of what I do. The more exciting stuff is the storytelling, and I think that's why we're here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'll do, I'll produce short features. For example, this Super Bowl pregame um, show, I'll probably do one or two short features, roughly five, six minutes each. Um, I've done a couple of documentaries for Showtime, which is a sister network of CBS, so I've done long form. One of them was on the, on the Army-Navy game called The Game of Honor. Um, which was my first one, and then I did one on Lawrence Taylor, the ex, the former New York Giant. So I've done short, long. Um, I also produced for 60 Minutes. Sorry to give you this list, but it just sort of ties into some of the things I want to talk about. Um, so I've done a bunch of 60 Minute stories. Um, that's exciting to do. And then I guess the thing that, and then in addition to that, I forgot, almost forgot, Inside the NFL. I produce Inside the NFL for Showtime every week. I'm the showrunner, and that's one day a week during the NFL season. So I, you can see I go from graphics to producing a studio show with Phil Simms, Boomer Sice, and, and Ray Lewis. So, but the thing I think that's most exciting, the thing I love doing the most is the game opens. And again, you know, the game opens, I don't think anyone at this point is tuning in to watch a game open. They're tuning in to watch the game. Um, does the game open change the rating? Absolutely not. If we did a game open or didn't do a game open, our viewership would be identical. Back in the day, I did a little research on teases. Um, and back in the day, they made sense. When there were three networks, CBS, NBC, and ABC, and there were no remote controls, if you were watching a show, the next show would start with the teaser, so you wouldn't get up and change the channel. It would tell you, hey, there's a game you want to watch. And it actually may have affected the rating back then. But it's become a thing, and, and thankfully it's become a thing because they're really fun to do. They're challenging to do sometimes because the story, the game is not always great. Um, sometimes you've got two bad teams or one good team and a bad team, or it's week 16 and neither team can make the playoffs and you have to come up with an idea. Um, but those are... Those are tough, but they're also fun because they're challenging. So what I'd like to do real quick is just show, I think I've got a little bit of a montage of different things that I've done. I think all of these are pretty much from the last year or so. Um, different games, basketball, NFL, and, and so on, but you'll see. Oh, yes, I am. Mr. Malcolm, it's good to meet you. It's not a commercial, though. We actually, we call it a tease. A tease. tease. Yeah, we like to tease the viewers with a big production so they tune into the game. But if they see this, aren't they already watching? I mean, so what are we teasing? That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> Isn't it though? I guess it's just the terminology we use. I don't know. It's sports television. Sports television. Yeah. Okay. Different than what you're used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably, yeah. Not your 
Jets out of the playoffs last year. That's right, big boy, but at least we were in the hunt. You called to brag about that? Say it with me, Jim. J-E-T-S. Stink, 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 old man. Oh, that's not very nice, Jim. <laughs> They're the ones who made it. The ones who can become legends. Hey, for the win! Remembered forever, right here, tonight. The man behind him takes it in his hand and throws it with his hand to someone who catches it in their hands, you see? And then everyone gets terribly excited and the man with the ball jumps up and down and does a silly dance because finally somebody's going to kick the bloody ball. Why do you call it football? It's handball. The Raiders and Chiefs don't like each other? Come on now. You don't like your math teacher. You don't like the guy in the office down the hall. Please. Tonight, hate is alive and well. The idea was that Lambeau and Palace would play for and coach their team. Good choices, wouldn't you say? These guys got right to work. Lambeau, he put an ad in the paper promising players a chance to sock someone in the face and not get thrown in jail. Sounds reasonable. Secret ingredient in the seven layer. Okay, can, can we hold it? In fact, let's just cut it. I apologize. This isn't working. Is it my story? Because I got a better story. No, no, your story's great. Everybody's stories are great. We just have to go in a different direction. So let's break this down. Let's get this light background out. We need something darker. We're going to have to shift this lighting. This whole thing needs to feel bigger. I can go bigger. Kevin, this is the Super Bowl. Cornette goes airborne. It's that simple. I mean, that's what I would have said. <laughs> you know, uh, otherwise it's, it's too complicated. Please tell me you're rolling on that. You never said action, so... So you could see... A few things I'm proud about in those clips, um, and I'll talk about resources in a second, I realize you're not gonna be able to maybe get Jay-Z and, and Ron Howard and John Malkovich, I get all that, but I'll get to that in a second. But one, a couple of things I'm proud of is the variety. Um, we don't just, sports teases or opens are traditionally big music, orchestra, in your face, overwritten, and that's sort of the, the tipping point was the Malkovich piece, just sort of like making fun of all of that, and um, it worked. Uh, but again, what, I, what I'm proud of are, is the fact that we were able to tell stories in different ways, whether it was John Cleese and comedy, or if it was parody with Malkovich, or Mahershala Ali coming off an Academy Award, doing the open to the NCAA championship basketball game in a traditional format, in a speaking to camera, and that was nominated for an Emmy, I'm proud to say, even though it wasn't breaking the mold. Um, but like I said, the variety is there. But the other thing I'm really proud of is the fact that, and this isn't just in those clips, basically anything I do, uh, you will never ever see a visual effect. I am not against visual effects, they're not for me. I think it's a waste of time, personally. Visual effects are just time taken away from crafting a story, in my opinion. Um, and the other opinion of mine is the fact that I don't care what cool visual effect you come up with, no one at home is gonna be impressed. They've seen everything. They go to the movies, they watch shows that do effects that you could never come close to or I could ever come close to. So a real quick story, back in the day when I was first starting with, them, with CBS doing NFL games, every game had four hours in an edit room at Beetlejuice, remember Beetlejuice? You ever, hello, you awake? You remember Beetlejuice? <laughs> So, great movie. Yeah. So at a facility, we had four hours in an edit room each game to do a 30-second open. And I'll never forget, I would always spend my four hours just the shots, the music, and the writing. And the editors were always confused because about two hours in, they'd, they'd always ask me, like, well, when, when do we start effects? Because a lot of guys would just put together 
into the first hour their, their baseline story and then the next three hours work on effects. So I knew early on that that wasn't for me. So again, again, you know, effects are cool and I think they work and I think they can be effective, but I'm personally not a fan. I think if we're talking about storytelling, if you can tell a story in camera and with words and music, I think that's all you need. Um, go ahead. May I add a comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So creative people don't always see eye to eye, uh, but in this case, we see directly into each other's eyes. I've been doing this a long time. There is no substitute for great shooting, great editing, great writing, great voiceover. All the rest doesn't mean anything. Yeah, so I think that's like a big sort of like teaching point. I do speak at schools a lot. Um, I've even FaceTime into classes. That's always really high on my list of things to say. Again, people are going to do what they do, and that's cool. It's just not my thing. Um, resources. Yes, we, I'm able to call Jay Z and say, "Do you want to be part of the Open to the Super Bowl?" Get that? I get it. It's going to be a lot harder if you're RIT up in Rochester and you ask you know, Jay Z to come do something. However, I will say this: you do have alumni. Some of you schools have famous celebrity alumni. I'm. You never know. Maybe they'd be willing to do something. I can go out and hire actors. I can go out and do things like that. Some of your schools have drama departments. You have actors on campus. Why not do a reenactment, a historical piece about your school with the drama with the drama students and get them involved? So resources, you know, I was I didn't come to CBS and someone handed me over the Super Bowl open and said, "Hey, go go at it." Like I had to work my way up and when I first started, I had zero resources and I was pretty creative about figuring out a way. So, again, I think, you know, it's one of those, it's the old thing. If, if there's a will, there's a way. I really do believe that, you know, there's a limit to it, but I do believe you can go out and get and tell the story you want to tell. If you really want it, you'll figure out a way. And even if it means breaking a few rules here and there, not that I'm encouraging that, not that I've done that, maybe I have, maybe I haven't, but I'll move on from there. So the, the next thing is storytelling. You know, I mentioned earlier about how it's hard to tell a story sometimes because the story's not there. When I first arrived at CBS, one of the very first things I told the executive producer at the time was, I want to be involved in the Army-Navy game. I don't care how, which way, I just want to be involved. I have zero military in my family. My family is an immigrant family from Croatia. My parents came to this country as immigrants, were, did blue-collar labor. I grew up in a one-bedroom apartment in Astoria, Queens. I have zero, I'm not, I'm barely, Amer I'm born here, but I'm kind of like half European, half American. But I grew is, up is in New York. Is anybody from ICE here? What, ICE? ICE? No, I'm cool. I got my, I got my passport and I'm good. Um, I got citizenship, I'm good. Uh, but, but I grew up in New York City with no college football. If you grew up in New York, you know there's no Oklahoma, there is no Notre Dame, there is no local, I guess Rutgers is the closest thing, but back in the day, you know, some people are laughing out loud, that's bad. Um, so I grew up with no college football, but Army-Navy game was the only thing I cared about from a college football standpoint. I just gravitated to that game as a little kid. I just loved watching the march on. I loved everything about it. I wanted to be involved. So from day one, whatever I could do, and thankfully over the last probably 10 years now, I've been doing the opens to that game. I did the documentary that I mentioned. So this is, this is an opportunity where it's rich in story. There are hundreds of stories. I don't need to tell this audience what the Army-Navy game means, but this year we were able to do something. I think, you know, having done it 10 years, you sort of exhaust, even though there are a lot of storylines, it becomes sort of the same Army versus Navy. These kids are going to go on to five years of military service and, and all that. We've done that. We've told that story. We tell it every year. I think we do a good job of telling it, but I felt like we needed something different, something new, a fresh approach. And, you know, I think what we did not only was impactful from a viewership standpoint, it was impactful from, an, from a professional standpoint. We, I mean, this isn't me bragging. This is just as I guess fact, but we submitted, I'm, sh I'm saying this out of shock more than anything else, we submitted it in seven different categories for Emmys, it was nominated in all seven, which is crazy, it only won two, but whatever. Um, but Because some other guy won a whole bunch of Emmys for another tease. Yeah, I actually lost to Malkovich three to four times, but 
Um, I'm going to show the piece only because I'm proud of the fact that we took a story that's been told over and over again, and we found what I felt was a unique approach, a different approach. It was an aggressive approach. It was uncharted waters for me. I'd never done anything like this before, so it was a little scary because we were doing a period piece. I'd never really done that before, but um, with all that said, here's, here's the open to the last Army-Navy game. From the very beginning, it's always started the same way. For every one of them, across generations, the president has across eras, the Army and Navy into action. across history. Over more than a century, they've all waited to get the same word to get word that they've been chosen. Chosen to sacrifice. Are you kidding me? To dedicate. There's a letter. To serve. Dear Mr. Elliot. Dear Mr. E. Dear Mr. Holden. You have been selected for a mission. And authorized to report to the United States Naval Academy. The United States Military Academy. On the 9th of July, 1960, 14. On 12th July, 2001. And Appalachia, Maryland. West Point, New York. So proud of you, son. Are you sure about this? Yeah. Did you hear that? Boy's going to be an officer in the United States Army. Only they know what it feels like to be a different kind of kid. The kind of kid willing to risk life for country. So many people ask, why would he ever commit to going to this type of an institution? It's scary as a parent. It's something I think every parent thinks about. But you're proud of him on the other hand, you know? Is they're actually giving up a lot of themselves to support and protect everyone else. How many people can say that that's what their kid decides to do? It's in his heart. And it has to be in your heart to defend the country. You can expect to be challenged academically, physically, morally. Uh, your summers <laughs> basically don't exist. You miss out on the kids' holidays. It's not going to be an easy journey. You have your academics, you have your military duty, and you have football. Yes, it is just a game, but a game that epitomizes everything they're here for. It's the only game that everyone's playing in it. They're willing to die for everyone who's watching it. Since 1890, the Army-Navy game has embodied the timeless commitment of a group of young men and women to the nation and the ideals that both academies serve. War heroes, presidents, and Heisman winners have all graced this stage. Enemies for one day who know their calling will unite them when they leave the field just as their stories do wherever in America they began. Now flying New Jersey. Chicago, Illinois. Phoenix, Arizona. Nashville, Tennessee. Our son is Jackson Dittman. James Nautical, number 19. Johnny Trainer, Number six. Andrew Wood, number 61. Go Navy! Lead Army! Fort Atkinson is cheering for us. Come on, you got this! Back to back. We can do this. Kick some butt. Go Army! Lead Army! Go Navy! Lead Army! It's a library. Never forget how it all starts for them. Never forget what it takes to decide as a kid that your life is going to be about more than just yourself. You're a mother, you're always gonna worry. That's her first one. She carried them around for, for 40 weeks. They would do whatever it took to protect our country. It's tough. Once he decided and thought that this was right for him, I supported him 100%. He knew it was the place for him, so I really just tried to embrace that. I'm not going to be selfish. That's the unselfish thing for your kids. You let them go. You got to let them go. From the very beginning, it's always started the same way. Across generations, across eras. They've gotten word that they've been chosen to sacrifice, to dedicate to serve. And they've headed off to West Point in Annapolis. It takes a certain kind of kid to commit to these institutions. Now today in a football game, 
celebrate the courage of every man and woman to ever make that commitment. For the 118th time, this is Army-Navy. I've watched it a hundred times. I get tears in my eyes every time. So a couple things. I'm going to pass it over to Craig, and I'm going to give him a lot of credit here because that was supposed to be, what, three minutes long, and it came in at around five minutes long. And uh, basically I told him, I'll give you a three-minute version for air. We'll put the five-minute version on, on social. And he found out a way. He found a way to put that on the air. And it aired, and it was a big hit. And thank you, Craig. And you can take it from here, and I'll take a nap. Go ahead. Uh, so first let me start uh, by saying, you know, we throw around terms and in, in covering the sports world, great, spectacular, uh, all these superlatives. Uh, Pete Radovich is a genius, and I say that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, he takes a blank, it, it's, it would be a, a man's pride and work to do that once. He does it over and over and over again. This past year at the sports Emmys, there were five teases submitted for Emmys. Three of them were produced by, T by Pete. Now I feel bad for making fun of your shirt. Yeah, <laughs> good thing my wife's not here. She would. By the way, that was my bar mitzvah picture. <laughs> so. The difference between Pete and myself, besides a lot of the obvious ones, is he takes this incredible blank canvas and paints a masterpiece. I have a piece of clay covering the game that's already well on its way to being a story, uh, and then we have to refine the edges and, and make it into something. Uh, I have to be ready, people in my position have to be ready to adjust at a moment's notice. We, we get prepared, we build a playbook to what we think the story is going to be. But the people that are really good at telling the story of a live event are the ones that can adjust on the fly, call the, the right play from the playbook at the right time, make sure you're telling the story of what's happening in front of you. One of the things, I, I have the great fortune of working with a crew that has been together for a lot of years. We know each other's moves. Uh, what I try to do with my announce team is we rehearse but I, st I still want it to be as spontaneous as possible. And in our interaction, Pete and myself, I give him a wide berth creatively, <laughs> basically say, here's the, the rough time, he's gonna go over it, I'll make it work, because he's gonna deliver a spectacular way to start this broadcast. Uh, we received the, this piece that you just saw overnight or first thing Saturday morning, I showed it to my announce team once, about two hours before air. We had already worked out the elements for our opening on camera and the way we we're going to come on the air, behind the tees, et cetera. About a half hour after seeing this, my analyst, Gary Danielson, you know, hit me on the talkback switch, said, hey, I want to talk to you. I said, yeah. He said, I've just been thinking about that tease, and I want to throw out our open, and I want to talk about these kids. Can we do that? I said, absolutely, we can do it. So I want to roll my, our, our first clip here. And excuse me for looking at the, my, my notes here. So if we roll uh, clip two, uh, no, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm screwed up here. So many jokes, and, so, uh, so many things I could say right now. Well, I wanted to roll the end of the tease, and I don't know if I have it listed here, but the last 30 seconds of that tease really ended up being the entire theme. Yeah, go ahead and track it. Across generations, across eras, they've gotten word that they've been chosen to sacrifice, to dedicate, to serve. And they've headed off to West Point, in Annapolis. It takes a certain kind of kid to commit to these institutions. Now today in a football game, Celebrate the courage of every man and woman to ever make that commitment. For the 118th time, this is Army-Navy. And I think the line that was lost there, but we really built our entire broadcast around, which was the theme of that tease, is that 
It takes a special kind of kid to commit to Army and Navy. And if we roll the next clip, this is how it translated into our opening on camera with Gary Danielson. We talk about quarterbacks, quarterbacks, because they handle it on every snap. <laughs> but it's more than that, isn't it? It is. We visited both places, West Point and Annapolis, and we met the guys that don't always have the football, but are such an important story about this game. Let's start with Bryce Holland, number 65, Chandler, Arizona, the center. Two-year starter. He told us at lunch, Navy has no idea what they're <laughs> in store for. His offensive line teammate, Brent Toth from Charleston, South Carolina. He came to Army. 220 pounds now he's an nfl prospect 6'6, 305 pounds how about ryan england we met with ryan he's the captain he could call the defenses he never even cracked a smile the whole time we visited with him what a leader from swanee georgia and jeff Ajekum, how would you like to be a wide receiver for a team that never throws the football he's embraced it and he blocks all game for Navy, the mids, we met Anthony Gargiulo, fullback from Freehold, New Jersey. During the summer, he considered whether he would even stay. Now he's the battering ram for this Navy offense. Tyler Carmona from Davie, Florida. He was going to enlist to be a Marine until he got his appointment to go to the Naval Academy. He'll be catching the ball. Sean Williams. A star for Navy last year, 14 tackles, an interception, two fumble recoveries from Memphis, Tennessee, and Micah Thomas, the man, the leader. <laughs> he said he plays for the Brotherhood, and his dad told him when he was deciding whether to go to the Naval Academy, don't make your decision for the next four years. Make your decision of what this will mean for your next 40 years. What a I, man. I loved how Army coach Jeff Munkin put it. For five seconds on every snap, it's going to be a fist fight. Then we're going to line up and do it again. You bet. Welcome to Army Navy, Brad. Every one of those players is a special person. And uh, almost every one of those players in our Open had an impact. One of the players that was not in that little montage but was in Pete's Open, John Trainer. Uh, had one of the biggest plays of the game where he uh, took a pitch and got the ball down to the half-inch line, which led to the winning touchdown. Uh, another player who was not in that montage, but also was a special kind of player and person, made this play, which was the play of the game. Uh, so if you roll clip three, please. Third down and three. Perry keeps it into the secondary. Off to the races again. Can he get another one? Tripped up at about the 11-yard line, or he would have scored. I think right at the end, I think it was number 50, Bale Wolf, that just barely made the tackle. No, it was actually number 59 that time to the outside. Voigt that hustled all the way. The outside defensive end. Voigt made that tackle. Think about that. A defensive end running down the field just clips. Barrier would have been another. And, and listen, we got it, right? Tackle the quarterback. He's the guy that is going to keep the ball. And let's skip to clip five, which is the follow-up to that. Army by a point, 5-10 remaining. They would have been trailing had it not been for one of the defensive gems of the game, Gary. Yeah, remember this. Going back, a touchdown-saving play by Johnny Voigt right here. They call him a monster effort player. And watch his monster effort chasing down the fastest guy on the team. Does he think he has a chance? He doesn't care. He tries and lays out and makes the play. Could that be the saving play of the day? Special effort by a special player who's a special kid that comes all the way back to that incredible open. Uh, I just want to skip down to the very last clip, and you can hear the passion in Gary's voice as he talks about these people. Uh, ultimately, the game was decided by the quarterback of Army, Ahmad Bradshaw, who scored the winning touchdown. And we have the good fortune of covering these players for multiple years. And here's what Gary had to say about him uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the game, clip number 10. You don't want to come in second, but you want to sing second.
two years in a row for Army now. After the 14-year drought, they can claim back-to-back -back victories for the first time since they won five straight from 92 to 96. I said it at the beginning of the game, now I'll say it at the end of the game. Welcome to Army-Navy. If I do 15 more, I'll never forget this one. Actually, I queued up the wrong clip, but that's okay. Uh, you get the idea that we started the day with this incredible storytelling about special people participating in a special event. And all the stars played their part. And uh, it was a thread throughout. And uh, we started the day with it, and we finished the day with it. And, uh, you know, it was a spectacular event. But ultimately, from the broadcast standpoint, you know, we followed the storylines, and some of them were different than what we had prepared for. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what you have to do. You have to be prepared to understand what's in front of you, and it doesn't matter whether you're producing for your in-house arena, you're producing uh, uh, for your webcast, whatever it may be, you know, make sure that you follow the storylines that are developing. Make sure what you set up in the beginning of the day with Pete's Incredible Tees, with our opening on camera, you bring full circle back to the end of the day. And, uh, uh, you know, it's all about connecting the dots. And there's lots of different ways to do it. Uh, but at the end of the day, as Pete said, great shooting, great editing, great writing, great voiceover, uh, connecting the dots from your open to your finish and how you got from, from, from those two spots. Those are, the, those are the keys to storytelling. And no matter, we have all the resources we have in our, our production, all the resources Pete has, or all the resources that you guys have or, or don't have. And I just look around the room and there's some old uh, friends here. Rob Dustin, who is a friend from CBS going back 35 years. And, you know, Rob knows what I'm talking about. And he's done it for CBS. He's done it independently. Alex Burchie's over here. And, you know, he's taken what he's learned take to the Big Ten Network. Uh, Andy Katz performed, you know, many years at, at ESPN as Mr. Basketball and continues to do great storytelling. Uh, every person has a story. Every story ultimately determines what that person is and how they perform on the field of competition or probably in life. And uh, as broadcasters, that's a big part of what we do. There's lots of different ways to do it. And the one thing about story that, you know, that I've kind of figured out over, over time, and it took me a little bit of time to figure it out, and I can give a little bit of a story from uh, speaking to this point from 60 Minutes, and I'm not going to name names, but they were doing a profile on an NBA player, a very prominent NBA player, and it was becoming difficult because he kept showing up late or just no showing to interviews. And they were going to do the piece because it was already promoted and scheduled. But the problem was that they were having a problem with the player. And one of the executives of 60 Minutes said, well, that's, your, that's part of your story. It's like, what do you mean? Like, he's not showing up to interviews, he's late to interviews, he's a pain in the ass. That's part of your story. And sometimes the story is not what you expect. Now, the player got wind that that was going to be part of the story and things changed. Um, it became much more cooperative, but that wasn't the reason they did it. The reason was that the story is right in front of you. So I can't tell you how many times, you know, I don't go in the field as much as I used to. I don't do all my shoots anymore. I send out producers, and we have a player who we're Let's just say, as an example, we have a player we're profiling, and it's a championship game, and we want the great ending. We want him to have 30 points, 20 rebounds, make the game-winning shot, and I'm getting text during a game. He can't make a shot. He's benched. This is a nightmare. And I'm texting back, like, that's your story. Like, it didn't end the way you wanted to, but the story's right in front of you. He's struggling. Things aren't always the way you want it to be. And when you're telling a story, I, I do it too. Like I have this sort of vision where you go into a game where you go into a story and you want things to play, to fall into place exactly the way you want it to. And sometimes it takes a little bit of sort of like a step back to realize, wait a second, it's not the way I wanted it. It's not the story I wanted to tell, but 
it's still compelling. So that's another thing about, you know, with storytelling and what we do. I mean, I think it's becoming, you know, it's a cliche sports story. Like your character wins the championship game. He or she is the hero and everyone's happy and it's great. No, it's not always like that. And sometimes you just have to roll with the punches. And sometimes you're given gifts you don't even realize. The story is maybe even more compelling because it wasn't the way you wanted it. So I think that sort of plays into, like, that's from experience. And I think early on, you know, like everyone else, I kind of had these visions in my mind that this is the way it should all play out. And that, that's one thing I wanted to share. Um, another thing I wanted to really men mention really quick about Craig, he's been so nice to me, I feel like I have to say nice, nice things about him now. Um, at the Emmys this past year, or just a couple of weeks ago, we have at the sports Emmys in New York, for those of you that have been, know like at the last Emmy of the night is sort of like the best, you know, best picture. It's the big, it's the big one everybody wants to win. It's always, every year the, the, the order goes different, but that's always the last one. And Army Navy was nominated and we all internally thought like, oh, that's cool, it got nominated, like that's awesome. And then Craig went up on stage to accept the Emmy for, for what was it best, what's it called technically? Awesome. Live sports special. And it was an amazing moment for our division. Craig, I think, got emotional on stage. It was a great moment for everyone in our department. Um, you know, we don't have a, a million properties um, like, like ESPNs of the world. We only have a few, but they're pretty prominent and we take pride in them. And, you know, college football, Craig oversees all of our college football, as most of you know, with the SEC being the biggest conference in football and him doing the biggest game every week. It's a big responsibility, and to, to come through in a game like that in the middle of an SEC season and switch gears and do an Army-Navy game is not easy, but I, but I do want to commend Craig for the great job they did, him and the announcers and his entire crew, because I think that's a big part of why we're here today, is that that story that we were able to tell from beginning to end um, was pretty compelling, so I think Congratulations, Craig, on everything. Thank you.